So let's start taking a look at the parametric modeling. Now that you have an idea of what the tools do, let's go through and show you a little bit about applying geometric constraints and then also um, dimensional constraints. Now, a couple things, I guess, I think I got ahead of myself there, is that I wanted to just make sure that it kind of understood is that, so when you're creating the geometry, um, the more time, um, you know, that you spend in it, uh, for example, the, the constraints you saw in those last three, okay, the one that was in the middle, um, it takes a little bit of planning and effort, right? More than just plain solid, traditional solids modeling. Adding that little bit of time and effort obviously gives you a much more uh, adaptable and modifiable, um, you know, uh, piece of geometry. But there's really, that time and effort is only justified if, one, you need multiple instances of the design. If you only need one and you're just going to draw it once, then you're probably not going to spend the time doing this. Um, and the other thing is that all of the different, um, you know, designs, that they differ from one another selectively, meaning that they're not identical or just scaled copies because it wouldn't make sense to put the time and effort into it. However, if it is something that's going to change a lot, you need more than one of them, they are going to differ uh, selectively, then certainly uh, using parametric modeling makes sense for you. Uh, and remember, this parametric modeling is really just a set of equations that's used to drive the size and the shape of the solid. So let's go through and, and draw something. The typical workflow would be we would draw a profile. So I might start with something that you guys use all the time. We use tools like and from the and this is from in fact I can pick it from the drawing uh, workflow, which is typically what a two D workflow. We can just select something like Play Smart Line, and I'm just going to start drawing. I don't really care the length of this, to be honest. So you know, here's 25. It really could be anything. I'm just going to snap to the end because that's what I want to anchor it to. That actually, that blue curve that you see there is the profile that this is going to follow. And so I'm just going to kind of haphazardly draw this. And I don't really care much about what it looks like because my constraints are going to kind of dial this in for me. In fact, let me bump up my weight a little bit just so you can see it a little bit more. I realize in the preview it doesn't display very well. There, it, it displays a little bit better there. Um, if you take a look up on the drawing tabs, and now this is like a typical 2D, you know, 3D workflow. And we also have our modeling tab that's up here you'll notice a constraints ribbon tab that appears in both of these. This contains our 2D, our 3D, and our dimensional constraints. So we'll begin by constraining this. So what we'll start doing is we're going to fix this right edge, right side, if you will, of our profile. And we want to tie it because we want it tied to this profile curve. So I'm just going to select here and put a little constraint in there. I'm also going to set the the uh, fact that the angle needs to be defined on that. Okay, that's a, I've been I've added two basic constraints to it. At any time, I can check my geometry with what we see here called the show degrees of freedom, which allows me to select that and say that there are five ways that that can move or be modified in some way. We're going to try to get this as close to zero as possible. At this point, I could say, well, I know that the top and bottom are always parallel, so we'll select those. You'll notice the geometry update. It also adds, and let me go to element selection so you can see it, a little glyph that appears. If I put my cursor over the top of it, you can see that those two are tied together. They're showing that those two lines are indeed parallel, that that is the fixed point, that the angle is constrained. So every little click that I provide with some of these, some of these constraints that you see up here will start to drop that degrees of freedom. In fact, if I take a look at it again, what was it? It was four before, still four. I haven't done much to, to change that. Let's come over here to angle, for example, and I'll put in uh, an angle, uh, a dimensional constraint. Now, I don't really care about the distance. And by the way, these may appear like dimensions, but these are uh, these will go away. They're basically, as I zoom in, you can see the location and how that looks kind of change. And I might even change, set this to like 135, kind of change that, come over here, and we'll do the same over here. We'll put another one in here from 173 to maybe 135. We'll make it the same. All right. So I can start adding some dimensional constraints to this. Again, using the show degrees of freedom, 
I can start to see that this is dropped down to two. Okay, we have a distance here, by the way, that needs to be defined, and that should square away everything we need, as well as a base. We could add a top to it, but the top will be defined by the the base as well. And we'll come into our variables, and let's define a couple of those variables. So we'll come into our local variables, and we'll say, all right, we want an overall width that we need to set. That's what we want to define it as and say, all right, I want to set this to be uh, 27 feet. Let me just put that in there. Oh, 27.5, how about that? We'll pick that. Now, how do we apply this? Well, if you remember just a second ago, I've used the angular dimensional constraint. I also have one for by element. Similar to what you might do like with a dimension, when I give a data point, but it's not a dimension, looks like one. You can see that it says 23.415. If I move my cursor down and give a data point, you'll see I can correct that if I want to and say, oh, it's 25 feet, it's 26 feet. But I also have a variable drop down that's there. It's kind of tough to see, but you can see it says overall width. Instead of me defining it at 27 feet, I can say tie it to this variable. You'll see that it changes and it sets it to 27.5. I need another variable in here. Well, I want to drive the slopes. The slopes are going to be equal in this case because I've made these two parallel to one another and the lengths are going to be based on whatever the, the angle actually is. So I'm going to say, I'll just call this slope, something, something simple like that. We can have different types of variables. They can be a distance, like you saw on the, the base, the, the overall width. They can be an angle, a number, lots of different things. I'm going to set it as an angle. And here, let's kind of make that a little bit sharper. We'll say 110. <clears throat> That's what, what we want to use. How do we apply that? Now that I have these in here, these dimensional constraints, how do I apply this variable to the dimensional constraint? Well, it's as simple as using element selection. Selecting it, you can see it turn yellow. So I can right click, go to edit dimension, and select slope. And you'll see this one automatically changes. These are parallel to one another. They're going to be equal to one another. Again, I could come in and say, well, how close am I to having a fully constrained profile, which is what we're trying to do. We take a look, I got one degree of freedom. And okay, that one degree of freedom, there's a couple ways we can define that. One way is going to be, I'm going to define the distance, and we'll just call this, whoops, helps if I click in the right location. Let's go to rename. Distance um, bottom to top. And I'm going to set this to be maybe 275, something along that lines. Again, you saw how I would apply that. I've defined the variable. Get that out of the way. Go to distance this time. And why am I not using by element? By element is requiring an element to actually be there. The distance is really just two points from this line to this line. You can see it's set to 0.757, definitely not what I have. I'm going to select distance top to bottom. And we'll notice that the geometry changes as a result of it, okay? Um, and actually, I guess I do need to put that over there. I must have missed that. Let me make sure I have it set. Edit that. Set it to slope. There we go. All right. So now I just have a 2D profile drawn. If I need to make changes at this point, I certainly can. I can come to the overall width and say that this really should be 26.5. That my distance top to bottom should really be 2.25, and make an, make adjustments to my profile. At this point, I just have a 2D profile. That's it. What I want to do is end up with something that looks like this. So. Again, what I'll do um, is I'm going to use some of the tools that we've been that you may have been working with. For example, here's my 2D profile. There is a B spline curve that we want that to follow. Um, earlier, I had talked about how the constraints tab is on modeling as well as it's in the drawing workflows. I want to now just me briefly mention that parametrics is really built right in to all of our tools for things like curves and solids. You'll notice that all of these tabs right on the modeling workflow. We don't have to go dig for these. They're right there in our modeling workflow. All we've got to do is say, I'm drawing a solid or I'm drawing a surface, and it's right there, kind of almost at my fingertips, if you will. So I'll go to solids, and I wanted to mention how it was kind of built right in. Obviously, the constraints tab, the fact that we have these all directly on the modeling uh, workflow. 
But also, if we take a look at tools like Extrude, you'll see there's an option for parametric, for the parametric solid. If we look at Revolve, you'll see a parametric option that's there. Okay? All of that, like I said, built right in. But you'll also notice that earlier we created variables, and I applied those variables using some of the constraints. How would I use those variables if I was doing something really simple, like I want to place a slab, and I want to define uh, the, uh, the, the width, the length, and the height, all based on variables. Did y'all notice this little symbol right here? When this is turned on, this gives us access to the variables tabs. Okay? It lets us define and set these based on a variable. So I can either hard code it by just typing it in, I can manually do it by giving two points, or I can define it uh, and set it as a variable. Give it a name. Okay? So all of these tools, all of the primitives that you see here, Things like extrude, the distance, uh, cut for if it has a, a, a cut, if it's a through cut or a, hole, or a hole or whatever it is, the diameter, the draft angle, all of these things have access to what you see under constraints and variables. So this is what I mean by it's kind of baked right in. It's, it's built right into all of the workflows within MicroStation. So without having to listen to me too much, let me go to solids. Let's go to extrude along. And let's push our little profile along that. Uh, I want to make sure the path is shown just so you can kind of see it. Is that I'll start by just picking the, uh, the path. I'll pick the profile and I'll accept it. All right. So there it is. It's drawn. Nothing too exciting here, but let's make this so we can see it. How about the, yeah, that's good enough. And let's just rotate this up so you can see the original profile. Now, why, why do I want to show you the original profile? Let's say it's a week later, and we're told, hey, guys, you need to make a change to that. That, uh, um, you know, the, the slopes need to change. So we'll come in, pick element selection. If I click the geometry, you'll notice a couple of glyphs appear, right? So there's the original profile that was here that was our, um, excuse me, not the profile, our original um, uh, spline, okay? That's available for us to make changes to. There is the options for the extrude along. Do you remember I came down and made sure that I could I, I could set that to be uh, either hidden and so on. I made sure it was visible. There's all the options if I said, oh, I need to apply a scale or a spin or anything like that. So all that's available to me. And then the original profile, if I click on it, there it is, all stored directly on the geometry. Now, could I come in here and right click and say edit dimension and make a change to that? change it to 27 feet or whatever. I could, but kind of defeats the purpose. You guys saw earlier, we had the constraints tab with the variables that allows me to make those changes. This really does need to be 27.5 feet. It also needs to have a different slope, not 110. We want to make that like 135. You'll notice as I make those changes, uh, you'll see the geometry update. Now, the, the overall width you know, difference between 26.5 and 27 doesn't make a huge, huge difference. But if I make it 25, you'll see the geometry change a little bit. Kind of tough to see. It doesn't change much. But again, watch these two sloping sides that are here. When we go back to 110 degrees, you'll see those change. Okay. So making changes is pretty easy. Uh, I can come in and update this really at any time. Okay. These parametric elements that you see here store and keep a record of how those objects are built. You saw the glyphs that were all there for things like the constraints. You saw that there was one for the path itself that it followed, uh, the extrusion, and so on. All of, those, all of that can be changed at any time. So you can change any of the parameters of the tools. You can change the sizes, not just the sizes of the profile, but you can go in and say, I want to change how I originally used the extrude tool. Okay. Parametric models have a couple of benefits that you should just know, know right off the bat. One, uh, you can probably guess that it allows you to have lots of different design alternatives. So this little ramp that's here, I can have multiple different uh, profiles, if you will, uh, that are stored. And I can test and try various sizes and different combinations of the parameters to determine what, you know, what's the best way to, to go. I can also accommodate change a lot faster. I'm going to save a lot more time because honestly, if I drew a profile 
in, let's go back a version or so, and I said, I'm going to push that profile along that path, and now I need to modify the path, and now I need to modify the profile, I would get the pleasure of redrawing the profile and redrawing the path. Maybe I can modify it a little bit, but I'd have to delete my solid to start off with. Okay, So I'd have to redo some geometry. So it saves time because you can edit the part without having to recreate it or redo it. It also helps you manage the complexity of your design. So you can create really intricate. Now, this one's real simple, just so you can see how it can be created start to finish, if you will, in just a couple of minutes. But you can create pretty intricate. It can, there are going to be a lot of variables, how about that, for different parts that have relationships between the different 3D solids. One of the things that, and, and honestly, you, you wouldn't be able to do it manually. It would be much, much too uh, complex. Now, we didn't talk about this yet, uh, but you also have some of the 3D constraints. And this is what I'm talking about by if this had a relationship to something else. Uh, there was a door, there was a whatever that needed to be driven based on uh, a variable, uh, based on the fact that something was connected to this. We have some 3D constraints that are up there. Same things you see over here in the 2D, parallel, perpendicular, coincident, and so on. Okay. All right, let's jump back to the slides here. And... If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you, and see you next time.